videos. Uh, this series is actually um, a set of uh, reflections on uh, the lesser known figures of uh, the, the period that we call Renaissance in the history of Kerala. But it's not necessarily on obscure figures, it's also about presenting novel readings of very well known figures. In fact, uh, the whole idea of freedom. Um, you know, was articulated in uh, very, very uh, different specific ways in uh, specific streams of the uh, so called Malayali Renaissance. Not all thinkers articulated it in the same way. In fact, uh, there is reason, very good reason to think that the, this period in Kerala history saw the confluence of many different ways of articulating the idea of freedom and thinking of society itself as a concept, as an abstract concept. Now, uh, unfortunately, in many of our uh, the popular articulations of the Malayali Renaissance, there is a dumping together of all these different strands. There is, in a way, we kind of uh, somehow confuse the boundaries and the politics of these different strands and somehow, you know, uh, lump all of this into the same progressive mm -hmm. basket. This does not serve us very well. And as we, I think, many of us have witnessed in the recent uh, debate around the Supreme Court judgment on the entry of uh, women of menstruating ages into Shabrimala, very clearly we saw that there are parts of our present that we really cannot account for unless we have a more richer and complex understanding of the early 20th century, the spirit which is referred to as the Renaissance. I think Dr. Srikumar's work has been extremely useful in this regard, and we are proud to have him here today. Uh, Dr. T.T. Srikumar does not need much introduction to those of us at CDS. He is an alumnus of CDS. Uh, his, uh, and a very distinguished interdisciplinary scholar. But I must say that my own memory of meeting Dr. Srikumar is when he was a student at CBS. And I did not really recognize him as an economist. I actually recognized him at that point as a very promising historian and a cultural theorist. I'm really very happy to see after all these years that he has kept alive these two strands of his intellectual activity. He's as much a cultural theorist and a political thinker and a historian as he is has, he's an economist, as much as an economist. So that's a kind of scholarship I think we should all aim for. And I hope the students of CDS are uh, taking note of what I'm trying to say, because it is possible for all of us to it aspire to a kind of interdisciplinarity that brings clarity to thought and uh, you know wipes off the illusion of compartmentalization that the disciplinary regime uh, enforces. So I will not take more time. Uh, so uh, let me invite Dr. Shri Kumar to deliver this talk. We are very grateful for your presence here today. Um, it will be wonderful if you can speak for some 45 minutes and then we will have a round of questions. So thank you very much and please. Am I, am I audible? You are. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Devika, for this uh, generous introduction and uh, thanks to Center for Development Studies for uh, keep inviting me for some of its uh, <clears throat> interesting activities. It's always a pleasure and privilege to associate with uh, CDS. Uh, not only as an alumnus, as uh, Deviga suggested, but you know, one of the, as one of the premier uh, institutions that uh, <coughs> explored knowledge at the frontiers, always. <coughs> so this particular uh, uh, paper I'm discussing here today is um, part of several, you know, kind of interventions that uh, uh, I had to make during the <coughs> very recent. Uh, developments in Kerala following the Supreme Court um, <clears throat> order, which permitted uh, women 
uh, to enter premises of uh, Shabarimala uh, temple. So there was a there was a there was a, a, a kind of uh, <clears throat> interest in the uh, um, you, you know the Renaissance past of Kerala, how it is you know kind of relevant in in in, in contemporary Kerala society and things like that. So it was in this larger context that I thought it is necessary to look at the contributions of people like Ayankali, for example, uh, Sri Narayana Guru, and then Chattabhi Swamigal. These three people I consider as, you know, people who attained enlightenment during the same period, which is, you know, kind of 1880s. Although Ayangali is not considered to be a saint, I think that, you know, he had that intellectual enlightenment in the, uh, you know, 1880s, and that actually helped him to uh, uh, you know, change the historical destiny of Kerala by having this Milivandi um, Yatra, uh, uh, which is quite famous uh, in, in Kerala history. And then, you know, 1889, Sri Narayana Guru had this uh, uh, idol installation, which he called Rirava Shiva, and we know uh, all the uh, details of uh, his uh, intervention and then how it was uh, uh, a radical rupture in, uh, in, in, in imagining, you know, a kind of uh, future of Kerala society. Like that Chattami Swami also had claimed to, you know, uh, attain uh, uh, or, you know, uh, enlightenment during the 80s. And then he also began his uh, spiritual and uh, political uh, activities during the same period as Ayangali and uh, Guru. I mean, these three people knew, uh, you know, uh, and Guru and uh, Chattami Swami used to associate more closely. They were classmates, they were colleagues, and they had, you know, uh, a kind of very... Uh, uh, formal and informal, uh, you know, kind of friendship. But Ayangali was not directly. Uh, it was very late that Ayangali even met uh, Sri Guru. It was in 1912 or so. But then, you know, uh, he had his own. Uh, that's what I said. I mean, he was an avadutan of, of uh, you know, uh, kind of his own uh, in his own way. Uh, and he also carried out, uh, uh, you know, certain political activities, which became very relevant for reimagining, you know, uh, kind of Kerala's future. Uh, so it was in this context that I, uh, uh, you know, began to think about reassessing the contributions made by these three, uh, uh, you know, nice and figures, so to say, uh, Ayengali, uh, Sridhara Guru, and Chattambi Samal. This is part of that larger project. So this, uh, in this particular paper, you know, like which is titled, uh, you know, uh, somewhat intriguingly, deconstruction of the of the Shudra. Uh, I, 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 I'm looking at the. Contradictions of uh, the Hindu revisionist theology that uh, Chattamay Swamigal propounded, <clears throat> and how we can actually, you know, uh, kind of knit together some of his uh, uh, perspectives and uh, and ideas, uh, and make them more intelligible in the larger context of reassessing Kerala's uh, uh, um, enlightenment and renaissance uh, project. So, you know, he, 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 I consider Chattamay Swamigal has, you know, a kind of uh, promoting a kind of theological rebellion against Brahmanical hege hegemony within the larger historical context of negotiating pan-Indian Sudra identity in general, about which, you know, people like R.S. Sharma, Kanja Yulaya, Pandian, and also talked about this pan-Indian Sudra identity, identity in, in general. Uh, and also, I need to, you know, kind of situate uh, Chattamish Swamigal in the specific context of the imperatives of caste reforms in 19th century uh, Kerala society. So these are the two, you know, uh, kind of tangents that uh, I've, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, chart for myself to uh, uh, relate to this kind of a work. So there are three important discursive strands that consecutively emerged in the attempts of uh, Chattabhi Swamigal uh, uh, to come to term, terms with the ideological supremacy of Brahminical Hinduism in Kerala. So I'm basing my, my analysis on three fundamental texts that he has written during the last decade of the 19th century. One is actually Krishtamada Nirubanam, which has two parts. It's a critique of Christianity, but it has got two parts. One is Krishtamada Saram, the essence of Christianity. And the second is actually uh, uh, um, Krishtamada Chedanam, a refutation of Christianity. So these are the two parts of that, that particular work. And which is followed by another major work called Vedadigara Nirubanam, you know, a critique of the right to Vedas. Uh, uh, and then, you know, uh, immediately after writing Vedadigara Dhirubana, he also went on to write another interesting historical text called Prajina Malayalam, the early land of uh, Malayalam. These were the crucial texts in understanding the ideological contradictions in the process of Savarnaka's formation in the first half of the 20th century, Kerala. And, and also the subsequent social transformations that kept various, uh, you know, constituents of hegemonic uh, Savarna caste power alive and active in the state until uh, uh, today. 
Uh, so my basic, uh, you know, kind of argument is that his self-reflexive writing unfolds in three different directions in, in, in the text that I already mentioned. First, in Krishnamada uh, Nirubhanam, he takes a stance of a staunch adversary of Christianity from the perspective of an assertive Hindu theology. You know, he strove to create an oppositional space to Christian faith, both by refuting its internal rationale and establishing the superiority of Hindu uh, uh, theological vision. I mean, he was a very honest person, I mean, you know, with, with a lot of integrity. That is why his, his text has two parts, actually. The first part is actually a more or less reasonable, uh, a, a, you know, a, a kind of elucidation of uh, Christian faith. I mean, he, he is not misrepresenting Christian faith, but he is a, is a sharp, he provides a sharp critique of it later on, uh, you know, which, which is a different thing. I mean, there is this is something that we need to learn from him, you know, uh, in, in terms of our methodolo methodology of refuting uh, other arguments. And, you know, and, and second, uh, his caste location as a Shudra and his defense of Hindu faith, however, faced a fundamental dilemma. Given his caste location as a Maya Shudra, his authenticity as a spokesperson of Hinduism was undermined by the very scriptures that he used in his critique of Christianity. The most formidable objection to uh, his donning the cap of a theologian was the prohibition that a Shudra Nair, uh, 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 you know, for a Shudra Nair, it was both a sin and crime. Uh, to read and study or even listen to the foremost scriptures of the Hindu religion, that is the Vedas. You know the story of, uh, you know, the, 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 the story about Varlathol Narayana Menon, who, uh, famous poet in Kerala, uh, who translated Rig Veda. I mean, later on, you know, he lost uh, 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 his power to hear. I mean, he became deaf. So people said that, you know, like in Manusmruti, it is said that, you know, a Shudra who listened to the Veda, you know, you have to pour uh, uh, boiled, uh, you know, lead into his ears. Uh, so the divine has actually poured boiled lead into the ears of Varlathu Narayana Menon because he translated Vedas, and that is why he has become tough. I mean, this was one story that uh, that was very, you know, uh, 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 much popular in in Kerala among caste elites at that type, point of time. So this was actually forbidden. I mean, you know, uh, for a Nayar Sutra to uh, you know represent the Vedas or even listen to Vedas. So his subsequent work, Vedadigaya Nirubhanam, hence proposes to challenge the Brahmanical cosmology for its outcasting of the Shudras from accessing knowledge in general and Vedic scriptures in particular. So along the way uh, of his critique of the exclusive rights that postponed cost to Vedic knowledge, he examines the rationale of forbidding access to Vedas, not only to Shudras, but to women as well. And, and that is where you know, his, his innovative approach you know, gain some significance. He builds a certain unlikely subaltern solidarity of Sudra men and women of all Varna castes. Again, you know, something that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, 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 modern feminism, uh, you know, uh, would have learned from him and also uh, 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 preached. With the exception of all those who were outside the Chadra Varna system, this is where actually the most interesting aspect of his uh, intellectual enterprise, uh, you know, LA is. I mean, he did not actually include people outside the Chadra Varna system in his... Uh, 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 analysis, but then he was not a he was not a cost prejudiced person. I mean, Somigal is well known for his costless, uh, you know, wealth and charm in the world view, and none of the primary treatises he expounded extended. But 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 none of the none of the primary thesis that he expounded extended any powerful gesture of solidarity uh, towards the Varnales caste who lay outside the Chadra Varna system. In fact, there are anecdotes in which people say that you know he he never practiced any. And it's actually widely known. I mean, as I said, he was a very honest person and he did not actually practice untouchability. There are anecdotes in which he has reprimanded people who practice untouchability, etc. But I'm trying to say is that, you know, uh, like his texts do not actually uh, incorporate this particular uh, idea of him into, 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 into the text. So his primary preoccupation within the larger schematic of the Hindu, you know, uh, in, in, his, uh, in his work, remained a, a kind of arbitration of his sutra subject position within the larger schematic of the Hindu cosmological representation. So while the composition of Vedadigara Nirubhanam helped him to accomplish this mission through a tightly argued case for sutra's right to knowledge in general and Vedic scriptures in particular, it was impossible to disregard the social reality that a mere claim to Vedas alone does not empower the sutra to attain nobility or respectability in Kerala. And that is where, you know, that he wanted to write this whole book uh, uh, of history called Prajina Malayana, because the social formation in Kerala in particular was dominated by the ideological superiority of Nambudiri Brahmins, whose social hegemony in practical terms extended much beyond the domain of culture to the economy and juridical spheres. 
So a, a third step in his reflexive critical enterprise, Somiger ardently turned towards the possibility of a critique of Brahminical claims that permeated the socio-historical juridical discourse, shaping the unique system of caste practices that existed in Kerala. So Prajina Malayalam part one and two, there are two parts to Prajina Malayalam here, where the products of his imminent inevitability of sustained critique of the claims of Nambudri Brahmins. So this is not about Vedas in general. This is not about Hinduism in general. This is a critique of Nambudri Brahmins, uh, 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 a direct critique of Nambudri Brahmins and their ideological perspectives. So the central argument in Prajina Malayalam, which rests on the quintessential reasoning delineated in Krishnamada Chaitanam and Vedadigara Nirubhanam, is geared toward the need for asserting the theological authority of Nayars as a known Sudra caste group within the system of Chaturvarnya, a system he wants to reinterpret, but one that was, nevertheless was. was unwilling to relinquish completely. So the three texts provide an assortment of contradictory subject positions of Samigal from a Hindu epistemological, you know, from a Hindu theology and stance exposed in Krishna Nirubhanam to that of an epistemological campaigner who digs open a case for the theological endorsement for access to Vedas for all men and women within the Chaturvarnya system on the one hand, and then on the other, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, rejection of his caste identity as a Sudra on the other. So while remaining uncritical to Hindu cosmological schema, which he considers as a superior mode of uh, self-seeking and uh, 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 truth-seeking. So, you know, he wants to retain the uh, superiority of the Hindu religion. At, at the same time, he wanted to make some uh, you know, theological revisions uh, uh, within uh, uh, its um, worldview. So the uh, <clears throat> so what I'm, I'm trying to argue here is that this particular discursive strategy that Swamigal indigenously unfolded, you know, had a deep and lasting impact on the political consolidation of Nair power in Kerala. The re-empowerment of the Sudra Nair caste in Kerala in the first half of the 20th century and consolidation of elite caste power in the hands of the Nairs in the post-independent period enabled Nayas to emerge as the single most voice of Malayali Savarnatha, you know, the Savarna self of Malayalis, and the sole claimants and interpreters of ritualistic Hinduism. This is, this is, is a story, you know, completely confining to, to, to Kerala as such. So the, while the Nambudris continued to hold ceremonial authority, Nayas took over the mantle from them as the prime ideologues and arbiters of Brahminical cosmology that more or less reserved its primeval features sans parading its outright violent practices in public sphere, constrained by constitutional and juridical boundaries, which in fact were, you know, also, uh, 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 you know, uh, became vulnerable during the, during the Sabri, Sabri Bala agitation. So what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, there is this general theory of ideology, you know, which uh, understands the concept of ideology as a symbolic surplus, integrating power and domination as structural forces, influencing the making of social relations in any particular social formation. So Swamigal's work, particularly uh, these three polemical texts that I have mentioned already, left behind not only a symbolic surplus for the reorient Savarnada, but along with it, he also outlined a revisionist Hindu theology that can be manipulated and whimsically deployed in the service of Savarna caste power, upheld exclusively by the Nair elites in, in, in Kerala. So the staunch critique of of traditional social order by its autonomy Swamigal, in which Nambudri is held, you know, kind of supreme ideological and social power, legitimated a transfer of the same location as defenders of Hindu faith and custodians of traditions over to the over to the Naya. And this is the this is the you know you know transformation that I'm I'm trying to uh, a, a, you know uh, uh, kind of discuss here. So first look at the whole uh, uh, premises of uh, Kustumada Chedanam and in multiple social contexts. Uh, I, 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 I have to bring in. Yet another, you know, uh, strand to this discussion, which is about the discussion on conversion uh, as a social issue, uh, and uh, in, in Kerala in particular. But it was deeply problematized at the national level by Swami Vivekananda after his visit to the state in 1892. I mean, the conversion issue in in Kerala was actually uh, 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 taken to a national platform by none other than Vivekananda himself after his visit. Uh, to the state in 1892, when he also met Atami Swamigal. I, I'll talk about it a while later. So he wrote in his article, Future of India, a quote, was there ever a sillier thing before the world than what I saw in Malabar country? The poor praya is not allowed to pass through the same street as the high caste man. But if he changes his name to a hotspot English name, by which he meant Christian name, 
it is all right, or to a Muhammadan name, it is all right. What inference would you draw except that these Malabaris are lunatics? They are home so many lunatic asylums and that they are to be treated with derision by every race in India until they mend their manners and know better. Shame upon them that such wicked and diabolical customs are allowed. Their own children are allowed to die of starvation. But as soon as they take up some other religion, they are well fed. There ought to be no more fight between castes. And this is unquote. I mean, this is what Vivekananda wrote in, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the article Future of India. And there ought to be, a, 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 you know, the important aspect of this critique was the emphasis he gave to social convention that permitted large scale conversion to, of Dalits uh, to non Hindu faiths. So, in yet another article entitled A Reply to the Malabar Address. And obviously, you know, there were some discourse that his article, uh, you know, uh, uh, which was based on his Madras address. The Future of India article was based on his Madras address. So, he made a reply to the Madras address. He reiterated the point further, arguing that, quote, in Malabar, a chandala is not allowed to pass through the same street as a high caste man. But let him become a Mohammedan or Christian. He will be immediately allowed to go anywhere. I mean, which is not absolutely true, but then that's how he phrases it. I'm quoting from him only. And this rule has prevailed in a domain, dominion of a Hindu sovereign for centuries. He meant, you know, the Trangur region. Unquote. So while this major intervention by Vivekananda helped to gain national attention to some of the anti caste struggles in later day Kerala, the emphasis he gave to the issue of conversion in Kerala came from the same reason detail that prompted Chattami Swamigal to write an ardent refutation of the principles of the Christian faith. Chattami Swamigal and Vivekananda had met during uh, uh, the latest visit to Kerala, as I already mentioned in 1892, although no reliable account of the meeting exists barring a few anecdotal uh, 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 references. I mean, one is that, you know, like Vivekananda learned some details of the Chinmaya Mudra from Chattami Swamigal. I mean, probably they would have discussed uh, 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 the work that Chattami Swamigal was doing at that time, which is actually, you know, uh, 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 activities based on his uh, work, his new work, Kustumada uh, Chetanam, that we are discussing now. However, it can be presumed that one of the topics that Chattami Swamigal could have discussed with Vivekananda was the issue of conversion to Dalit, of Dalit to Christianity, since Swamigal during that time was deeply engaged in a polemics against the Christian faith by employing two foot soldiers, namely uh, uh, Kaliangal Nilaganda Pilla, a Nair, and Karuva Krishnan Ashan, an Irava, to preach Hinduism to counter what they call the insults hurled by Christian missionaries. Uh, uh, you know, the individuals were trained, these two individuals were trained to use arguments Samigal had uh, provided in his book, Refutation of the Christian Faith. Moreover, the fervor created by Swamigal could have barely missed, uh, you know, Vivekananda's notice. So that is actually the, the, the interconnection between, uh, uh, you know, Vivekananda's own, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of critique of Kerala society, you know, and uh, uh, with uh, Chattami Swamigal's own work during that time. But then uh, it is not accidental that, so it was not Vivekananda who asked him to do this, but it is the other way. So it is not accidental that Swamigal's first book, after he was believed to have attained that enlightenment, was a piercing and keen critique of the Christian faith. It was part of a pan-Indian, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of Hindutva politics following the defeat of the Indian forces against the British in 1857. So movements to regain Indian pride emerged as a common agenda of Hindu revivalist platforms following the consolidation of British power in India during the time. So the major political plank of Arya Samaj, founded in 1975 by Dayananda Saraswati, was a simultaneous recourse to the propagation of the supremacy of the Vedas and a sustained critique of theologies of both Islam and Christianity. Now, while all other known faiths came under criticism of uh, Arya Samaj, the most pointed attacks were targeted on the activities of Christian missionaries and Christian theology, you know, per se. So Dayananda Saraswati's long and dense reputation of Christianity was included in his important manifesto, Sadhyartha Prakash. So in the first edition of the book, however, he could not publish this. Uh, it was published in 1975. The publisher was a retired uh, uh, British bureaucrat. So he refused to include chapters 13 and 14, which were respectively critique of Christianity and, uh, and Islam. So he feared the official backlash and then he did not uh, you know, carry these two chapters. However, in the second edition published in 1882, eight years before the publication of Samigal's book, these two chapters were also included in Sadhyartha Prakash. So while Samigal's book does not follow Dayanand's work verbatim, the connections between the text in terms of the emphasis and method cannot be overlooked. There are many similarities in the method of Dayanand Saraswati and Samigal. 
both upheld the Vedic notion of, uh, 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 you know, Brahma, supreme being, as superior to Christian faith, and attempted to demolish the cosmic vision of Christianity through the refutation of selected verses from the Old and New Testaments. Both believed in a direct encounter with the missionaries, either personally or through trained representatives. There were several elements common to the anti-Christian rhetorical trade also, unleashed by both Dayananda and Swamigal. One of the crucial similarities arises in the way in which Swamigal followed Dayananda in the critique of the biblical representation of Jehovah, uh, you know, uh, uh, prophets, uh, uh, Jesus, apostles of Jesus, etc. Dayananda uh, apparently did not know English. This could have been, and so he, he relied on the Sanskrit and English trans, uh, and Hindi translations of, of the Bible. Probably that could have been the case with uh, Swamigal also. So, but then Southern Travancore during the time was well integrated into the Tamil regions. And right from the early decades of the 19th century, Brahminical opposition to conversion of subaltern communities have been recorded by missionaries in the adjacent district of Tirudalvedi, a region quite familiar to Swamigal. Uh, 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 you know, and, and, and here, I mean, there is, there is this interesting article written by the Liebman on, on, on Chattamis Omegal, uh, where he discusses some of the unifying features of the anti-Christian rhetoric of Hindu revivalists. And he also provides a reassessment of Chattamis Omegal as an Ankani historian during the colonial period, viewing his text, I quote, as forged within the space of public disputation and the itinerary of, of debates and ideas in the public sphere that embraced the subcontinent. Uh, so this is this is actually a widely understood uh, you know thing that this was a this was a pan Indian uh, you know uh, kind of process, but then this was this was more uh, uh, you know uh, uh, kind of visible in 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 South India. So according to uh, 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 a there were you know kind of many missionary societies active during the period which were you know focusing on conversion like London Missionary Society LMS, which was founded in 1795, and the Church Missionary Society CMS uh, 1799. The Wesleyan, uh, Wesleyan uh, you know, Methodist uh, mission, then uh, Scottish missionary uh, societies, uh, which was later called, uh, you know, Foreign Missionary Commission, uh, Foreign Missions Committee or so. And then the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, SPG, founded in 1701, which again turned its attention to India in 1880. So the missionaries, but then what is interesting is that the missionaries, although they held, you know, the, the political power, uh, 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 you know, you know, by default, missionaries began to complain about persecution by Brahmins in Tinnaveli, you know, from the very beginning of the 19th century itself. So recorded in missionary literature as Hindu resistance or Brahmin persecution, its presence became more visible only after 1835. I mean, this is explained by Dogriti because, you know, like largely because of the, because the printing press was not available to Tamil ownership until 1835. So they started, you know, kind of printing anti missionary materials also. After 1935, so the for the 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 uh, you know clamor about uh, persecution by Brahmins also you know gained some kind of uh, intensity. So uh, so it can be understood that even uh, in the early phase of missionary activities in southern India, anti-Christian literature circulated either orally or in hand handwritten copies. So Dagriti cites Kenneth W. Jones and says Dayananda Swami Dayananda Saraswati's critique of Christianity as a good example of how sophisticated and vehement the resistance could uh, become. So it's, it's, so it's pointed out that the encounters between Hindu street preachers and Christian street preachers was not uncommon. And, and, and there is actually a, 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 a kind of historical uh, 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 interest, uh, uh, you know, that others have also drawn from this particular, uh, um, you know, set of events. Elizabeth Susan Alexander writes, quote, the late 19th and early, uh, early 20th century, Social cultural renaissance in India was thus the result of a process that Western Christian missionaries had, in part, initiated. The social religious movements were an expression of national consciousness that they deepened and growing spirit of nationalism in India. Unquote. So it can be seen that both Dayanand and Swamigal inherited this early Hindu eagerness to address the Christian missionary exertions in different parts of uh, uh, the Indian subcontinent. So it may be noted that most of the missionary literature mentions the resistance as coming from Brahmins. And here is where, you know, the crux of the issue, uh, uh, you know, lies. Many of the so-called newly emerged Hindu preachers belong to the Brahmin caste. And another important location nearer home that witnessed vehement ideological clashes between Tamil Brahmins and Christian missionaries was Jaffna in, in Sri Lanka. You know, Hindu revivalist movements of the Saivai tradition in the region put a stiff resistance to missionary activities during the later half of the 19th century. In fact, uh, 
uh, you know richardson quotes a poem by kapapadi uh, uh, nawalwar uh, you know uh, which uh, according to him reflected the intent and spirit of hindu revivalism and anti christian sentiment in the 19th century jafra uh, uh, the poem reads as follows the bible trembled at the fierce battle engaged with uh, 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 mutukama mutukumara kaviraj the bible fell down and lay unconscious when attacked by nawalwar and now it lies dead smitten by damodaran pillai i mean damodaran pillai uh, 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 mutukumara and kaviraj and uh, uh, you know kabapadi nawalwar were poets who were you know a uh, uh, kind of creating po using poetry uh, to oppose um, a christian faith so poetry was effectively used by the saivites in sri lanka during the the period so two anti christian poems for example jnana akummi song of wisdom and yesu uh, mada parikaram uh, which means eradication of uh, the jesus faith of the jesus doctrine they were written by mutukumara kaviraj as a response to you know uh, you know missionary activities in the in the jafna region so so the whole of uh, south india and uh, you know uh, kind of regions near it were engaging in 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 a, in, a, in a conflictual uh, you know uh, kind of relationship with uh, christian missionary activities mostly led by uh, you know uh, the brahmins so here also you know i need to you know look at the, the 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 nature of the context of this hindu christian encounter in india in the 19th century which was uh, you know uh, I, i'm actually using uh, an argument about this uh, made by sebastian wadapalli in his uh, thesis uh, he is not uh, referring to chatham swamigal but some of the things that he said actually you know uh, is, is relevant in the case of understanding chatham swamigal's anti christian writing in context first is uh, so is a kind of a version uh, to the orientalist constructions of hinduism both in its uh, british and german variations the entire essentialization of a religious phenomenon which is diverse and heterogeneous and then a consequence of this new hermeneutics was the prognosis of the vedic period as a golden age of hinduism and then the evangelical representation of hinduism in refutative terms and the adamant refusal uh, to acknowledge alternative faiths to have independent path to salvation closed any possibility of meaningful and transparent interfaith dialogues and this is what waterfall is says and finally he says that the consolidation of brahmanical response necessitated a denunciation of the about two strands of christian repudiation of hindu faith so as a strategic mediation a reinterpretation of the basic tenets of hindu religion was more inclusive than the various dogmatic brahmanical versions prevalent during the time and this became very vital along with an equally aggressive affirmation in the superiority of the hindu religion and denunciation of hinduism as a preeminent path to salvation so thus the two basic elements of the brahmanical response to christianity were one a rebuttal of christian faith on the one hand and an affirmation of the superiority of hindu faith on the other so if you examine the the detailed description of the logic critical techniques and style of disputation employed by dayananda as, as jones represents him his strong parallels can be seen as echoing in somigal's approach also so however if dayananda and somigal shared an anti christian proselytizing rhetoric the major difference between them was the former was a katyavad brahmin whose access to vedic knowledge was unquestionable and you know many of the others who i mentioned were also you know kind of brahmins uh, exceptions were there i mean that uh, uh, that's there whereas somigal was a shudra nayar whose claim to the vedas was at best ambivalent and at worst untenable according to hindu theology itself so the precariousness of somigal's attempt to attack another faith in defense of vedic hinduism could not have escaped his own attention as well as that of his well-wishers and more importantly of his critics within and outside hinduism given the given the you know a structure of caste ideological milieu of uh, 19th century kerala society so so as we can see from samigal's work he he not only you know a kind of intended to criticize, criticize christianity but also try to explain its principles in simple terms so that people would read and understand it and compare it to hinduism that's what i said i mean he was very honest in his in his you know attempt to represent uh, 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 christianity he did not misrepresent christianity i mean to be fair to him but he criticized this sharply which is a different thing so hence the first part of the book was written to explicate christianity and the second part to criticize it so in the first section uh, kristumada saram he explains as i said you know in a very reasonable way the ideas and concepts of christianity as they appear in the holy bible and in the second section these ideas of christianity are reviewed from the perspective of hindu faith so it was in this context as somigal felt it was important to address the skepticism about his right to engage in this discourse as a hindu since the so called hindu was divided into four caste groups among which somigal happened to belong to the lowest of the varna caste the shudra 
who was denied the right to utter or even listen to the Vedas, as I mentioned earlier. So in fact, Sri Narayana Guru also had faced a similar situation, but his solution was you know, much simpler and more straightforward one. You know, one thing that he said that, and, and he did not belong to the caste, uh, you know, uh, uh, framework, I mean, a Varna framework. I know he was outside the Chadruvarnya uh, system. I mean, he was an Iriyama. So he said that Sanyasa was given to uh, him by Britishers. Uh, you know, like it's the modernity that uh, helped me to be a, a, a saint. I mean, you have nothing to do with this. I mean, and your, your religion or your system has nothing, nothing to do with it. So it was, he said that his Sanyasa was given by, by, by Iriyama. And then, uh, he was not directly part of the Chadravarna system. And then, uh, um, uh, and also he was invoking the very fact that, you know, he was not part of the Chadravarna system by birth. Uh, uh, but, you know, on the other hand, uh, uh, Shudra belonged to the Chadravarna system by birth. Because Chadravarna is based on a manufactured consensus of forecast that constitute it. If you, if you look at, you know, R.S. Sharma's book on Shudras or any other work on Shudras in India, you can see that Shudras never revolted against the Chadru in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a big way. I mean, you know, there were, of course, I mean, there would be dissents or, you know, some kind of critique and things like that, but there was never was a revolt against the Chadru system by the, by the people who belong to the lower rung of the uh, uh, system. So it was, a, they, they believed in the, in that manufactured consensus. They were part and parcel of that system. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for example, you know, some people also said when the, when the idol installation, uh, you know, uh, thing came up, we could easily say that this is this is I mean, which means again, none of your business. My religion is different. My ways of being is different, and you know, my God is different. You have nothing to do with it. But you know, some people actually could not negotiate along those lines. So uh, some people understood that the question he needed to address was much more complex. Unlike Guru, some people was not willing to abandon the larger rationale of the Varna system. This led him to an uneasy mediation, a self-reflexive yet contradictory intercession with the fundamental Hindu belt and shock, uh, worldview. You know? The origin of the critique of Veda Digaram, the authenticity to talk on behalf of the Vedas, emerges from this ambivalent subject position as, as, as Sudra and a theologian of Hindu faith. I mean, this is the contradictory subject position. You know, he is a Sudra and also a theologian of Hindu faith, according to him. So toward the end of the 19th century in India, the so-called Brahmin resistance to conversion created, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a band of Hindu social reformists who advocated the supremacy of the Vedas as the holy scripture of Hinduism and also chose to redefine the practices by which they thought uh, that the power of Vedas was limited to the Brahmins. Uh, and I'm going into, into the details. I mean, in, uh, after nine, uh, 1857, an organization like Brahma Samaj, which was founded earlier in 1828, or Ayri Samaj, which was founded in 1878, were taking concrete political forms and were, you know, uh, kind of seeking to try to make uh, stronger uh, foundations for their religious ideology. So in a way, the whole Hindu revivalist movement of the period tended to redefine, uh, 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 you know, and there were streaks of uh, using the new form of Hindu awakening as a form of passive resistance to the British rule. Uh, although the actual practices that they followed, uh, uh, you know, kind of revealed more active collaboration uh, than much of the resistance. So, you know, the Hindu revivalist movement had this, again, this contradictory relationship with the, with the British. I mean, on the, on the one hand, there was this passive resistance against, uh, you know, foreign domination and what will happen to India under foreign domination. But at the same time, you know, they actually, uh, 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 you know, did not go into a direct confrontation with them. Why? I mean, and there's a reason why, you know, this was so. The fundamental objective was not to bring together all sections of the in Indian subcontinent against the British, but to constitute and define a Hindu identity by isolating others and then to further instill the division through religious discourses that would serve to organize the Hindu hierarchy in a more traditional uh, terms. I mean, this was the largest strategy followed by Hindu revivalist movements after uh, the, 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 the defeat of uh, uh, the, the rebellion in uh, 1857 until the formation of uh, International Congress in early 1880s. Uh, uh, that was actually another, you know, uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, even that uh, Hindu revivalists had to negotiate, and then we know how it happened later on. I mean, I'm not going, going, going into the details of that now. So, Arya Samaj and uh, Brahma Samaj has striven hard toward creating this organized awakening. For this, Arya Samaj basically took recourse to the Vedas and not Idhikasas and Puranas. Although Idhikasas and Puranas constitute the culmination of official Hindu theological system, because without the Shavadara and and mythologies of Trinity, it is impossible to define the theological structure of contemporary Brahmanical Hinduism. But our Arya Samaj advocated a return to the Vedas and attempted to restore uh, an imagined Hinduism that was believed to have been in existence from a rather unspecified mythic time of the Vedas. So this is important because Hindutva ideology otherwise did not come into a direct 
conflict with British colonialism or its institutional enterprise in, in India. Ari Samaj and Brahma Samaj constantly try to entice people into this newfound imagination of the Hindu, although the position of early Brahma Samaj was a bit more uh, nuanced. Uh, you know, Raja Ram Mohan Roy believed in a syncretic religion and uh, uh, and proposed the view that the unity of God contained in Upanishads and the moral teachings of Christ had some close resemblances. So, when in 1820, uh, Roy published his book entitled Percepts of Jesus, his most sympathetic portrayal of Christianity and Christian practices entailed an implied comparison with Upanishads and the Hindu uh, uh, practices. So, he, he, he used to say that, you know, both Christianity and Hinduism suffer from prejudices and superstitions, and very little could be gained from denunciations based on mutual misrepresentation. Uh, so, this was an early phase of, uh, of Brahma Samaj. Uh, uh, you know, while some uh, uh, other organizations took extremist positions, they advocated a complete return to the Vedic cultures. Others trained to maintain a critical distance from the Vedas by taking contradictory stance regarding caste, untouchability, and other traditional practices. So, however, disregarding such uh, subtle, you know, differences among these, these uh, you know, uh, kind of varied movements, they all shared a belief in the glorious past of Hinduism and a wishful yearning to go back or to revive this magnificent past. Though they never openly came in confrontation with the British, the Hindu reformists shared an anxiety about the future of Hindustan under foreign domination and constantly evoked and asserted uh, the existence of a glorious Hindu past that must be reclaimed. And this is, this is around the time that, you know, the divide and rule policy of the British uh, uh, helped the Hindu revivalists to, uh, to place the is Islam also, also as another that they need to confront. So, although Chattabhi Swamigal shared the anti-Christian ideology of the Brahmin-led Hindu reformist movements, he was characteristically confronted by the fact that his Sudra self did not permit him to be an equal partner in this decolonizing enterprise. So, he was opposing Christian faith in order to defend a religious system and a scripture to which he had by default no theological access or entitlement. It's not that somebody practically prevented, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chattabhi Swamigal from accessing Vedas or learning and things like that. That never happened. I mean, you know, this is not, uh, I'm not talking about at that uh, level. I mean, you know, like this is actually a, a theological, uh, uh, you know, a, a theoretical ideological confrontation that he himself has uh, brought forward. I mean, this is not prompted from outside. This is his own. Uh, you know, a, a, a kind of voluntary, uh, uh, you know, epistemological intervention. So, Vedadigaram Nirubhanam, in which he staunchly insisted that Vedadigaram or the right over scriptures was meant for all four castes and all Savarna women and not just for Brahmin men alone, found his context in this unique conundrum that he encountered. At a time when belief in the authority of Brahmins over the scriptures reigned, reigned through the entire South Asia, the rebellious call for reforms from a Sutra Sanyasin no. gained. Significant. So, Vedadigara and Nirubhanam fundamentally accept the supremacy and divinity of the Vedas, but simultaneously chooses to challenge the predominant view that only a Brahmin can learn and explain Vedas. So, the concepts of Sruti, Yukti, and Anipav. Um, am I audible? Yes, you are on. Yes. Uh, somebody, I mean, somebody's mic is on. I'll just ask uh, them to. Okay, 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 okay. So his uh, work combined the, uh, you know, so th the, what, what did he do? I mean, he, he, he relied on the very Vedic concepts like uh, Shruti, Yukti, and Anubhav, uh, you know, to put forward the idea that anyone who was interested in earth to learn Vedas could uh, uh, do so. So he employs a deeply hermeneutic strategy to disentangle the notes that tie him down in his work in defense of Hinduism. So in the first section of the text, he provides a detailed description of what Vedas entail by critically analyzing several theological interpretations of the, of the text. There are two distinct sects of theologians of the Vedas according to him, the Shraudhas and the Prabhaja Vedis. Uh, 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 you know, the, while the Shraudhas believe that Vedas were given to us by God, along with the universe, Prabhaja Vedis hold the, that the universe itself as given to us by God is the Vedas. So both sects agree that Vedas help us to know, learn the ethics of life, that is Dharma, Adharma. Uh, uh, but uh, but held Vedas were listened to from the voice of the God and hence called Sudhi. The Prabhanja Vedis were of the opinion that it was called so because it was orally transmitted from one generation to another. So it was very convenient for uh, Swami Girl to take the Prabhanja Vedis position. Uh, 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 you know, and he proceeded to dissect a set of dissect a few verses from the Vedas, especially those that have raised controversial significance due to the fact that they permit meat eating and give exceptions for sexual taboos. So he flanked himself with the Prabhanja Vedis who observed that not everything that appears in the Veda originated directly from the mouth of God. 
but that some words have been disfigured by oral transmissions that they have also been susceptible to ethical reinterpretations. So, in other words, he believes in the original Aurisheda, the impersonalness, otherlessness of the Vedas, but assumes that once it began to transmit from uh, you know, human to human, it was likely that it got corrupted. So, he even opines that some of the words in the Vedas, uh, 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 you, you know, might have been made by those sages or intellectuals who were deemed to be like God. And then, and, and that hence Vedas need not be derided for being internally contradictory at times. So he is, you know, kind of making his position acceptable to a large group of Hindus also. So he compares Vedic claim to truth, uh, to similar claims made by Quran and Bible to challenge that all of them directly emanated from God. So he attempts seems to reinterpret scriptures as a man-made uh, one, so that many of the normatives that were imposed through these scriptures could be questioned, delegitimized, and reinterpreted. And that is where you know the the radical nature of his attempt uh, rests. So, uh, uh, you know, as a, as a next descending point against the dictum, the Tamil Swami will print up the following, I quote, Yajna Valkya, who could not be defeated in debates by many stalwarts like Ashwal and Arthabhagan, etc., uh, was encountered and challenged by a woman, Gargi. And this story figures supreme in Brigadar and Upanishad. Isn't this proof enough to show that women had the right to access to Vedas? So then he goes on to challenge the rather compromising, you know, a view that Shudras were entitled to know the meaning of Vedas, but cannot stake a claim to learn uh, the Vedas. According to him, if their argument is true, it should also imply that the words of Vedas are more important than the meaning. So would someone say that the box holding diamonds is more valuable than the diamond themselves? So is it not the relation between word and meaning similar in relation, uh, 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 similar to the relation between box and diamonds? I mean, he he anticipates, uh, you know little bit of Derrida here. Uh, if someone uh, is asked if they want the box or the diamonds, but but you know who but a fool or insane would prefer the box? He argues that the relation between word and meaning is further explicated in one of the way, verses of the Vedas itself. Rigveda says, he says, quotes, you know, Rigveda says that one who has learned the verses of Vedas and doesn't know its meaning is like a pillar under the roof. So, you know, in, in, in a bold and, uh, and politically sensitive move, Samuel argues that the Vedas themselves make many contradictory statements where two paradoxically opposite rules are stated and noted that both had to be equally taken into account. So in one instance, Vedas state that Kshatriyas uh, should, should not be teachers and the Sutras should not be learners. But in another instance, it simultaneously also states that Kshatriya can be teachers and Sutras can be learners. So this shows uh, you know, that technically Vedas propose no such limitations at all. Thus the foremost strategy, Chathamani Swamigal, uh, 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 you, you know, was to deploy, uh, was to understand Veda, uh, you, you know, through an intertextual critic of the Vedas by unraveling the inner contradictions of the text, eventually making a monolithic, uh, dogma driven interpretation of them completely untenable. So, and then uh, he particularly takes up Sutra uh, that was much in vogue during the time for further introspection. He employs a deconstructive strategy in appropriating this particular sutra, in approaching this particular sutra, which was provided as evidence to prove that Shudras and women should not read Vedas. The words Nastri, Shudra, uh, uh, Vedam, uh, Vedam uh, is soon dismissed by him as neither emanating from Vedic nor Smriti traditions. Much more, much before a feminist critic of Hindu theological system emerged, Swamigal raised the issue of women's right to knowledge in general and claim to knowledge the Vedas in, 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 in particular. Uh, 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 you know, he has written an entire article, uh, you know, thesis on his approach to the question of man-woman relationship. In the, in the treatise, he vehemently opposes all ideologies that consider, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, women as inferior to man and argues that any attempt to view women as mere machines of reproduction and to consider them as dependent and ignorant slaves of men should be condemned. So his feminist radicalism simultaneously reflects the limitations of his time as well as his own attempts to transcend them. Uh, so he says that it, he invoked the Vedic and Upanishad examples of Gargi, Maitreyi, and similar uh, instances of reference to women in the Vedic texts of enlightened Brahmin women theologians and argued that women and Sudra, uh, Sudras both deserve to learn Vedas if they prefer to. However, the disconstruction happens, to, happens when he shows disinclination to condemn it because it was possible to interpret it differently to mean that there was no compulsion on women and sudras to learn Vedas. So he was essentially interested in foregrounding a case for himself, whether uh, you know one has an interest in learning it or not, is what is 
uh, uh, more significant. And then, you know, like this was central to Swamigal's later intellectual enterprises, you know, like uh, writing book like uh, Advaita Chinga Patadi, a plan of Advaita, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 thought, then uh, Nijananda Vilasam, uh, Pranavum, uh, Sangya Darshanavum, and, and things like that, uh, and, and, and texts like that. For him, it was those who later interpreted the Vedas that falsified it for their own social gains, he said. I mean, you know, he, he says that, uh, uh, you know, it is common knowledge that the interpreters of the scriptures often try to preserve the false meaning that they attribute to the text in the hope that certain prejudices within the sphere of social traditions and rituals will, you know, continue to favor, you know, uh, them. And, and then more interestingly, uh, there are sections where Vedas inscribe the verses that are to be chanted by women. Uh, uh, you know, so he, he suggests that the, you know, the word is auspicious for Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, friend and enemy to plead to the Veda, Devas. Vedas can be taught to all costs, including the Shudra, I mean, within the Chadurvarnya system. So, you know, and then, uh, uh, Swamigal also invokes some important instances where Brahmin intellectuals attempt to suppress information that fervored a feminist theology of Hinduism. First, he quotes uh, 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 from Parashara Smurdi, where it gives unconditional freedom to the wives of absconding, dead, ascetic, impotent, or morally befallen males to remarry as and when they desire. You know, Swamigal points out that these are two sections in Parashara Smurdi that outlines the list of permissible activities in Kali Yuga and before. While the above quote falls within the activity that women can follow in the age of Kali Yuga, according to the original text, he says that Madhava Jaya, who wrote an interpretation of Parashara Smriti, misrepresented them as pertinent only to the edges before Kali Yuga. I mean, here is something that, you know, the modern day uh, Kulastri uh, can actually learn from uh, Chattabhi Swamigal. I mean, you know, like uh, uh, Vedas, according to Chattabhi Swamigal permit, I mean, Parashara Smriti itself permit, uh, and uh, wives uh, of absconding, dead, ascetic, important, or morally before me to remarry. And then, and in Kali Yuga, that, that's something that you can do in Kali Yuga and in other Yugas also. So it is not in other Yugas. I mean, it is actually relevant in Kali Yuga also. Then he quotes Rogas in Yajnavar Kismudi to argue that the text authorized the annulment of marriage for women to seek alliance with a more competent man. I mean, so even if this is not uh, all necessary, I mean, if you think that another person is more competent for you, you can just, you know, uh, kind of have a divorce and marry the new man. And, and, and uh, what is it called? He says that in such cases, Mrudi says, Veda says, uh, that she will be called Punarbhu, reborn, irrespective of whether she was a virgin or not. Uh, uh, but then he adds that Vidyashwar, uh, Vidyaneshwar, a Brahmin interlocutor, suppressed this crucial information in his interpretation of Yajnavalkya's Mrudi. So he is providing multiple examples where Brahmin intellectuals either mis misrepresented or misinterpreted Hindu texts to suit their ideological, you know, kind of perspective. So, uh, uh, so and then, so he continues to so he continues to argue that Shudras were banned from reading Vedas. How uh, uh, you know we may account you know for those Shudras who themselves wrote uh, you know a few Puranas. I mean you know, he goes on with this argument. I mean you know uh, uh, that, that you know they, he gives examples uh, from Hindu theology itself to suggest that you know Shudras and women were actually could be given access to uh, uh, you know uh, the Vedas. So so one of the curious arguments he introduces to tone down his rather drastic denunciation of views that do not favor Sudra's access to Vedas is a plea about how changes in social conditions should reflect our understanding and interpretation of ancient uh, 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 texts. So he states that as time changed and humans intellect also transformed, the modes of practicing Vedas also have changed. So instead of getting rid of the false interpretations of wretched scholars, there is no sense for him in accepting the untruths and cruel insults without critical scrutiny. And this is what this is the position that he is trying to expound. So he takes a further radical step and argues that one cannot categorically assert that everything in the Vedas was true. So it's, it's a, there's a denial of Veda, uh, you know. So some parts of the Veda is Dharma Kanda Param, uh, which is owing to human uh, practice, and some Brahma Kanda Param owing to the Almighty. For him, it's beyond doubt that much of this has to be discarded. So you know, so the, so the uh, I'm not going into the the, the you know the, the details of uh, you know his explanation. Uh, but then, you know, he says, for example, uh, 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 you know, uh, sections in uh, Kundariga Yaga that recommends a copulation between a widow and a bachelor, or in Ashwamedha Pragaram between a horse and the wife, or between a bachelor and a prostitute, which are permitted by several Vedic sections to push his position, questioning the infallibility of the Vedas. 
so he he takes you know you know not a very monolithic position but he is he is propounding his own you know uh, kind of worldview on to the vedas i mean you know uh, uh, he is creating meaning out of the of the vedas uh, you know from his own uh, perspective so he says that the filtered version is what is always preferred and this is why many scholars have chosen to discard process and sections in the vedas that they believe as untenable so swamigal positions a tradition of transgression against the tradition of status quo in order to find legitimation for the reconstruction of the figure of the shudra which in turn would help authenticate his own transgression on to the into the domain of the brahmin so this twin questions of authorship and authenticity of the vedas and the right to make meaning out of them remains indefinable for somigal despite resourceful hermeneutics that he deploys to deconstruct the figure of the shudra within the chaturvarna system so a con- contrasting perspective to somigal can be seen in ambedkar i'm not reading out that passage i mean you can you know read what ambedkar actually you know uh, 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 you know said about uh, the, the vedas for want of time i will not uh, you know kind of deal with this but then the absence of any such realistic counter thesis is conspicuous in the theological debate that chatabi swamigal initiated that vedas represent a blurred realm of rationality and irrationality that would be difficult to legitimate could have been immediately visible to swamigal given the dif- diffidence of his arguments and perspectives however he chose to remain a vedic scholar than one who would abdicate that role uh, despite his hermeneutic enterprise more or less making it in the open that vedas were neither divine nor chaturvarnya was an acceptable system of social organization and this is precisely where he realizes at another practical uh, difficulty in his work which is that he is writing this in kerala where uh, uh, namudiri brahmins are ideologically holding a hegemonic position so his work prajina malayalam or the uh, uh, you know uh, looks at the imaginary exclusivity of nayar savarnada so prajina malayalam is an important text that had far reaching impact on kerala society and politics if swamigal wrote kristumada chedanam to justify and protect hinduism as one you know rare democratic uh, theological intervention and wrote a fierce condemnation of the work of the christian missionaries he also found it important to attack a brahmanical that the brahmanical restrictions imposed on sudras in his vedadigara nirubanam as it was an ontological imperative for him to negotiate the his sudra self to engage in that critic enabling him to speak on behalf of hinduism against the perceived theological onslaught of christian missionaries so there is a deep interconnection between these two works and then what is the connection of these two works with prajina malayalam so he went on to write prajina malayalam which constitute a staunch and vituperative critic of nambudiri brahmins in kerala a first of its kind in the entire history of the region you know the book attempted to attain multiple objectives in one single stroke first it was intended to reclaim Uh, for nayas a higher social status that somigal argues existed in kerala before the advent of nambudiri brahmins second it also which was also an attempt to explore the prevalent myth about the origin of kerala as a gift to nambudiri brahmins from parashurama third it endeavored to show that nayas were a superior race in themselves within the kerala chaturvarnya system and they belong to an indeterminate higher asian a position that has been historically denied to nayas by the crooked nambudiri so it sought to establish the that calling nayar sudra was a misrepresentation of history since the land history power and past glories of the region belonged exclusively to the cultural and social economic prestige of the nayar community and they were ritualistically way above the categories of people who were traditionally believed to be uh, fitting to the sudra classes elsewhere in india uh, you know that is the exclusivity of the nayar uh, you know sudra identity that he uh, tried to uh, you know bring out so prajina malayalam is an all out offensive against the nambudri on the one hand and glorification of the nayar heritage on the other so uh, it argues that the origin of the nambudri clan is indeterminable because they were not vedic arya brahmins but pure dravidians even the word nambudri appears only in malayalam lexicon he says you know uh, 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 appears only in, a, in, a, in 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 the malayalam lexicon i mean even the word nambudri appears does not appear in, in the malayalam lexicon their custom of adding ru to their names as in narayana ru appears to have been borrowed from telugu people there are also nambudris who don't use the suffix to their names some nambudris are matrilineal and are not traditionally allowed to chant vedas though no one no one can be denied the right for him categorically they are quote mostly imitators of the aryans like those charlatans among us who imitate the foreigners unquote so in the beginning of the text he unambiguously puts down his twin objective as demolition of the nambudri superiority within the varna system that existed in kerala and rediscover 
as the glorious past of the Nayas as the dominant and hegemonic community in Kerala society, liberating them from the Nambuthi representation of Nayas as belonging to the Sudra caste. So he reckons with the fact that, uh, 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 you know, uh, <clears throat> the, the, uh, during the time of the writing of the book, you know, that Prajina Malayalam, the most of the feudal lots in the geographical region of Kerala are Malayali Brahmins, you know, when he was, he was writing the book. So they claim to possess ancestral racial superiority and he challenges the two basic assumptions that legitimate this privilege. First, the irrational belief that Parashurama had cleared the ocean. I mean, like, you know, uh, uh, he is not always historically very correct. We know the Travancore land history, you know, the land belonged to Pandaravaga. We know the, you know, history of uh, land relations in Malabar, which does not, uh, uh, you know, completely align with the image that um, uh, Chattamay Swamigal is trying to portray in his work and things like that. I'm, I'm not actually mentioning all those things because in serious, you know, this is all shared knowledge. We all, we all know that, you know, this is not uh, a, a close, you know, attraction of the truth that he is trying to articulate. So they claim to possess ancestral racial superiority and it challenges the two basic assumptions that legitimate uh, this privilege. First, the irrational belief that Parashurama had cleared the ocean, created the strip of land, invited Brahmins from other regions and had gifted it to them. Uh, the origin myth of the region, he said, uh, needed to be demolished. Uh, second, he said it was essential to wreck the false belief that Nambudris were foremost in the caste hierarchy and hence qualified to be the masters and lords of all other subservient castes. Caste. So as a uh, confident student of Kerala history, he argues that from old archives, traditions and practices and all rational reasoning, it is clear that these two claims are baseless. It is also evident that the land belonged to Nair castes and, they, and that they were also upper class feudal lords. The Nair class were Dravidians endowed with a lot of generosity and kindness and reached out to and was eventually trapped by a group of Arya Brahmins who were refugees in exile, ousted from the north. This book tries to prove that this is how the Nair communities came to be divided and dispersed as lesser and powerless groups stranded in the non man's land within the caste hierarchy. I mean, I'm quoting uh, uh, Swamigal. Towards this, it is proven here that Malayali Brahmins have no birthright in Kerala land and they are entitled to no caste superiority. Uh, you know, you know where land reforms began. And also that the privileges they enjoy rightfully belong to the Nair communities. I mean, I mean the rationale of the land reforms in Kerala later. Uh, from this point onwards, Swamigal tended to depend on the imaginary geography of Kerala with its invented occupants from uh, whom he called Nagas, a group of people, according to him, quote, relentlessly possessing the sword in hand and reigning supreme in the land he calls Asipastam. So he summarily rejected the Nambudri story that the land was called Bhargava Bhumi, and he redesignated Bhargava Bhumi as falling to the north of Karinyotapura. While Asiprastam, that is the land of Nayars or the Malayala Bhumi, was the land that falls south of it. So, having thus established the, the geopolitical uh, location of Malayala Bhumi, he called for a rejection of Nambudiri archives and referred to the work uh, like Kerala Olpati, uh, Kerala Mahatmyam, Jadi Nirnayam, etc. Uh, you know, he rejected them as, a, as having any authenticity at all. So, therefore, him manipulated and covered up the real facts with the selfish intention of retaining Nambudiri hegemony. So Samuel's rejection of works like Kerala Olpati involved an unprecedented subversion of the belief system upon which rested the historical rationale of Kerala's uh, land relations. So this categorical frontal attack meant a demystification of the primeval genmum right of the Nambudiris, which formed the foundation of the nature and structure of the distribution of rights over landed property in most part of uh, traditional Kerala. And then in an openly vituperative critique of the subjugation of Nayars under Nambudiri, he listed an entire you know, vocabulary of Ajara Vakugal. Uh, you know, that the Nayas of any social status were supposed to use while talking to the Nambudri, you know, which included words like Tirumeni, uh, you know, Tirumanasa, Kalpana, Arulpad, Arulapada, Adiyan, etc. On the one hand, and a whole lot of similar self condescending words that were used belittlingly uh, to refer to the, uh, uh, you know, food Nayas eat, the house they live in, you know, Kupamadam, uh, you know, and then uh, what is it, Tirukadi or, you know, non Tirukadi, you know, Kadi and things like that. Uh, you know, the money that they possess, etc. There were, you know, uh, kind of uh, the words that uh, Naya is supposed to use that when they talk to the Mudris. On the other hand, demonstrating the extremely pathetic social and cultural condition about which there was barely any awareness among the Naya communities, according to him. And moreover, Shudras, he said, 
still bathed in the false prestige if one of them was the son of a Brahmin. They reeked with fear and reverence. I mean, I, I'm actually quoting from him. When they were around a Brahmin father or master, Samigal lamented the fact that no other caste had such high admiration for another caste as much as Malayala Shudras are held for the, the Brahmins. So if this was their contemporary condition, when at least some resemblance of resistance had begun to appear, he wondered what would have been their stature in the past where when a Brahmin was literally thought to be the earthly god, Dhusira. So he contrasted this situation with what he thought was in fact the reality, the ideal future anterior that he imagined for Nairs. For him, despite the long history of subversiveness, subversive subservience to Nambudris, Nayas had evolved into a unique ethnic group who were physically fit, ethically upright, turned toward enemies and miscreants, had the flair for war, were adept in the, at the use of the sword, bow uh, or any other weapon, and were also proficient in martial arts. I mean, I'm quoting Rabbi Sobhikal again. They also sub sub simultaneously upheld the truth, uh, you know, were kind to the less fortunate, were God-fearing, and stayed away from alcohol, meat, and do not even think of illicit relationship with other women. I mean, this does not any way uh, uh, reflect, uh, you know, uh, the, the reality, but this is how we, he had this imagined figure of the Maya in his mind. The community possessed a history of sages and reputed men of intelligence. Nevertheless, he found it unbelievable that a such strong ethnic group had fallen victims to the machinations of the Brahmins. Nambudris are complete aliens to the land of Malayalam, where in even word sound Brahmana, was absent in the Malayalam lexicon for a long time, he says. So this slanderous anti Nambudri outburst that Swamigal unleashed had no parallel in Kerala history. Of course, in 1981, you know, Chandu Menon, in his novel Induleka, who had uh, thought of a character, Suri Nambudri Pond, there already, you know, social literary tradition where a Brahmin god or good, a Brahmin, you know, good or bad, is openly scorned by a Sudra. I mean, this was, this was actually not allowed and not known in Kerala uh, uh, before that in, in, in traditional you know, kind of literature. Chandu Menon had thereby overturned the social caste dictum that a Nambudri should not be ridiculed even if there were legitimate reasons to uh, show such disapprovals. So the Nair Nambudri coalition that suppressed the underclasses and subaltern caste groups in Kerala was not only a power sharing mechanism, its ideological power rested on an existential symbiotic of the Nair and Nambudri communities. So in the 20th century, it's only in the 20th century that Sudras realized that they had entered into a social trap through the system of Sammandam in which Sudra women were assigned as sexual partners of Nambudri men. But this happened when the community leaders emulated the reformatory seal of Sudra reformers from Chandumenon to Chattabiswamigal. But then the system of Sammandam was a unique system in which Nayas tried to transgress the limitations of endogamous marriage through a system of accepting Nambudri males as legal husbands of Nair women. In the technical details of the system, you know, not in the ideological, in the technical details of the system, the Nambudri Brahmin appears as a mere sperm donor who had no emotional connections or financial liabilities with his offspring. In return, Nambudri had to agree to a social covenant that, uh, uh, that only the eldest son in the family would have the right to officially marry a Nambudri woman, which they called Veli. So it is still perplexing to understand as to how such a covenant could be enforced on the Nambudri while the subservience of Nair community to Nambudris looked absolute. The alternative hypothesis is that Nambudris followed the system of elders and uh, managing the family assets and marrying from within the community uh, would help preventing the fragmentation of family property and eventual paparization. But it's a matter of historical and anthropological curiosity that if any dominant community would consider denying marriage alliances to most males who can only seek women from other communities, while most females would remain in their own community, would remain spinsters till their death, since eligible males were not allowed to uh, marrying with them, uh, marrying them uh, with the objective of uh, preventing subdivision of family property. This historically looks a little, uh, you know, kind of perplexing. I mean, we need to do more work on, on that. A more plausible hypothesis seems to be that the two communities were bound by an early social contract between them, in which these unlikely conditions were seen as mutually beneficial. Even if it was traditionally believed that the power flow was from higher cost to the lower. Curiously, we cannot also avoid the strange benefits that the sutras took out from the legitimation of a weird sexual partnership system. We could see that Nambudri community also took immense socio-political blows from this system due to which scores of Nambudri women had to remind spinisters for life. 
With the advent of the modernity and capital relations, the Maclean system began to disintegrate and the Nair communities began to abandon the system of Sambandham as unnecessary, as an unnecessary social uh, encumber. So in this context, Rabbi Swamigal had raised severe criticism against the Nair Mangudri uh, uh, League and he had called upon to stop the undue reverence uh, given uh, uh, to the Brahmins. Nair Service Society was an organization of Nairs that emerged from these socio-political influences. Naturally, the organization from the very beginning, uh, you know, from its very beginning was committed to come out of the Brahmin domination, but at once also attempted to preserve the caste privileges and the powers that they had managed to scramble from the Zambudris. So, in effect, it strove to keep the caste hegemony untouched and thereby also kept the caste structures alive and active. I mean, because, you know, from Chattabhi Swamigal's own narrative, uh, Nayas were the original, you know, inheritors of the, of the land, of uh, inheritors of the privileges. And also, uh, 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 you know, the economy and society of the imaginary land of uh, Malayala Bumi. So there are there are some specific contexts and reasons owing to which organizations like NSS or SNDP came into existence in Kerala. I mean, we have, you know, kind of discussed these things several times in CDS and outside. So I'm not going into the details of that. So their emergence is central to the core of the complex caste factors in Kerala as it transformed later in the 20th century. So it is during the period between 1890 and 1910 that the domination of Brahminical ideologies faced severe backlash and setback. I mean, uh, 1890 to 1910, I mean, in the period where, uh, you know, uh, Chattami Swamigal, uh, Ayangali, and uh, Sridharana Guru became very active. I mean, and, uh, th th that period. I mean, it's not that before that nothing has happened. I mean, I have written about that, uh, you know, in other articles. Uh, I'm only talking about the intensity of this uh, set of, uh, you know, events uh, during this particular uh, period, uh, 1890 to uh, uh, 1910. So it was during this period that, uh, I mean, not in terms of, you know, kind of compartmentalizing that period as something unique or anything, so that, you know, there could, you could see it's, it's not a, an exclusive, uh, you know, uh, period, but then the, the, the intensity of certain activities that happened during the period is critically significant. So it was during this period that the leaders of the resistance against rigid cost structures that had begun around 1800 attained more political clarity to understand and interpret caste system in its totality as a massive inhibitive socio-economic and ideological structure. So it is also during this period that the political outcome of the social changes that began from the 1850s began to get consolidated. So in, in literature, the most important instances of this reflection were Chadumainon's uh, Induleka and Poteri Kunyamu Saraswati Vijay. In Southern Travancore, the installation of the Chiton Idol at Arvipuram in 1888 by Sri Narayana Guru, Ayangali's Bullock Art Journey in 1993, Yedeva Memorial that followed the Malayali Memorial, several mirrored physical conflicts, conflicts that arose between the upper castes and Delhi's during 1898 to 1999 and the present struggle organized by Ayangali for right to education that followed the Mayapariya clashes formation of Ayangali Sadhujana Paripalana Sangam and his entry into Sri Mula Popular Assembly and many countless such events marked this period when the Savarna domination received the most powerful ideological backlashes ever. So it was during this period of political bedlam and uh, ideological uh, reconfigurations that Chattami Swamigal advocated the breakup of the traditional Nambudri Nair alliance to help the Nair community rediscover itself as a new Savarna hegemonic group, liberating themselves from the yoke of Nambudri dominance. So Delhi uprisings made the Nayas realize that this coalition had no legitimate ideological base or chances to survive. Prajina Malayalam was a text of imagined history and geography, promised to rewrite Kerala's past from the point of view of Sutra Nayas, emerged as a master narrative that motivated the Nayar elite to rethink their subordination to uh, Anambudris and come out of the whole, uh, come out as the whole sole defenders and spokespersons of a new Savarna consciousness. Uh, uh, you know, around which many later imaginations and representations in the Nair past, present and future began to get consolidated. And the fictional history of Travancore recounted in C.B. Raman Pillar's trilogy, Martha Dharma, Dharma Raja and Raman Raja Bahudu, the tiny princely state of Travancore was reconfigured as a powerful nation state, where the Chetriya king and his Nair loyal, loyalists repeatedly reassessed So let me say that, uh, uh, Devika, any idea, you know, like, 
where exactly I stopped. I mean, uh, I lost. Uh, Can you hear us? Uh, we can't hear you, Titi. Uh, we can't hear you at all. So the point that you know that I was trying to highlight in his uh, critique of uh, the Nambudri uh, 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 Brahmanism. Um, <clears throat> This particular text, uh, Prajina uh, uh, Malayalam, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, kind of. Uh... Hello, am I audible to you, Titi? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You are, you are okay. Oh, okay, I mean, okay, I got you it. Are your voice extremely faint in my uh, device, mm -hmm. but I'm hope I'm hoping the others can hear. Um, is he audible to everyone? I think so. Now I think uh, you know. I think he, he's very audible. He's audible, ma'am. Yeah, he's audible. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you know uh, <laughs> the, what I was trying to say is that you know like uh, uh, this particular alliance between uh, you know uh, Nayas and and Nambudris. He found something that uh, has to be completely repudiated. I mean, you know, like he did not agree with this particular alliance between, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Naya. Well, actually, he was not against the alliance per se. I mean, but the, the ideological dominance of Nambudris within the alliance, uh, uh, you know, is what uh, 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 disturbed uh, Chatham. So, you know, Naya Service Society, uh, you know, as an organization of the Nayas that emerged from these, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, uh, socio political influences was uh, very important, uh, you know, in, in shaping Kerala's uh, later history. So, naturally, the organization from its very beginning was committed to come out of the Brahmin domination. That once also attempted to perceive, you know, preserve the caste privileges and powers that they had managed to scramble from Nambudiris. So, in effect, it strove to keep the caste hegemony untouched and thereby also kept the caste structures alive and active. There are some specific contexts and reasons going to which organizations like uh, NSS or SNDP came into existence in Kerala. So I was, you know, uh, I don't know if that, portion, uh, that part was uh, audible to you when I, you know, kind of said this earlier. In CDS, we did not need not, you know, kind of explain all those historical aspects. I mean, this is a shared knowledge uh, that most of us have, uh, uh, you know, kind of got from endless discussions uh, uh, that we had on these uh, issues. So the, the, their emergence is central to the core of the complex caste structures in Kerala as it transformed later in the uh, 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 you know, 20th century. So it is during the period between 1890 and 1910. I don't know if this was articulated in uh, 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 my presentation before I lost uh, the connection. But I, I consider this 1890 to 1910 as the a uh, uh, period uh, when the domination of Brahminical ideologies faced severe backlash and setbacks. I mean, I don't consider this as a very exclusive period. Uh, you know, because uh, uh, you could see the same st same strands of resistance and opposition in other uh, periods also. But it was during this particular period the leaders of the resistance against rigid cost structures that had begun around the resistance uh, against rigid cost structures that had begun around 1800 attain more political clarity to understand and interpret the caste system in its totality as a massive inhibitive, uh, you know, socio-economic and ideological structure. So it is also during this period that the political outcomes of the social changes that began from 1850s began to get consolidated. So in the literature, the most important instances of this reflection were Chandumen on Sindhu Leka and Potheri Kunyambu Saraswati Vijayam. In Southern Travancore, the installation of the stone idol at Arvipuram in 1888 by Sri Narayana Guru, Ayangali's Bullock Car Journey in 1893, Irava Memorial and uh, that followed the Malayali Memorial, several myriad physical conflicts that arose between the upper caste and Delhi's during 19, 1898 to uh, 99, and the peasant struggle organized by Ayangali for right of education that followed the Nayar Pulaya clashes, formation of Ayangali Sadhu Jana Paribalna Sangam and his entry into the Sri Mulam Popular Assembly, and many countless such events marked this period when the Savarna domination received the most powerful ideological backlashes ever. So it was during this period of political bedlam and ideological reconfigurations that Chattambi Somigal advocated the breakup of traditional Nambudiri Nayar alliance to help Nayar community rediscover itself as a new Savarna hegemonic group, liberating themselves from the yoke of Nambudiri dominance. 
So the Delhi uprisings made the Nayas realize that this coalition had no legitimate ideological base or chances to survive. So Prajina Malayana was a text of imagined history and geography promised to rewrite Kerala's past from the point of view of the Shudra Nayas. Uh, and this emerged as a master narrative that motivated the Nayar elite uh, to rethink their subordination to Nambudis and come out as the sole defenders and spokespersons of a new Savarna consciousness, around which many later imaginations and representations of the Nayar past, present, and future began to get consolidated. The fictional history of Travancore recounted in C.V. Raman Pillai's trilogy, Martha Varma, Dharmaraja, and Ramaraja Bahadur. The tiny princely state of Travancore was reconfigured as a powerful nation state where the Chatriya Nair loyalists repeatedly reasserted themselves over their numerous dissidents, including the allegedly anarchic Nair oligarchies, uh, keeping invisible within the layers of the narrative the particular history of colonial subjugation that marked the epoch of political transition represented in these novels. In fact, Sivi Raman Pilla has written a book called Vaideshiga Adibatim. So, uh, you know, like it's not about colonial power, it's about Brahmin domination. The whole book is about Brahmin domination. Vaideshiga means, you know, like uh, Brahmins from Tamil Nadu, etc. The exclusive Triya Nair coalition in which conservative Nambudris soon became a minor partner began to establish their hegemonic political presence in the civil society and public spheres. Even Gulan Kunjampilla, I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a famous historian, you know. Uh, I like, uh, you know, uh, his Kerala history found Nambudri domination, uh, uh, you, know, you know, and he insisted that uh, this was emerging, uh, you know, in the medieval period as, a, as the sole reason for the all down decay, degeneration. Uh, you know, decadence, erosion, social cohesion, invention of caste system, and uh, what he described as the general cultural, economic, and social decline, political decline of the land of Kerala. I mean, he said that, you know, the, the Brahminical domination which emerged in the medieval period is responsible for all this. So his imaginary golden age of Kerala was yeah, a period he identified as an age bereft of any Nambudri influence in Kerala's societal do domains, strictly following the imaginary history of uh, Chakami Swamigal's Prajina Malayalam. So Kunjan Pillar's history, in fact, you know, he is someone who used the modern uh, methods of historiography, I mean, at least a semblance of modern methods of historiography and, and things like that. So he, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, kind of dismissing Kunjan Pillar as merely a coing uh, Chattami Swamigal, but there is an ideological, uh, a, a, you know, connection between work of Kunjan Pillar and what uh, Chattami Swamigal was, 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 was trying to articulate. The Kunjan Pillar's in history basically tended to fill up a major lacuna in the narrative of Chattami Swamigal. That was on how this reversal of power positions actually occurred. Kunjan Pillar argued using a near fictional narrative of a hundred years war between Cheras and Cholas, in which you no know, Nair soldiers, you know, in hundreds and thousands perished. And he used this to explain the material circumstances of this reversal of this reversal of fortunes of the Nair led civilization in Kerala that flourished in all its ways. So according to his account, Nair supremacy that existed in Kerala was destroyed by the conspiratorial Nambudri idea. Then the majority of the Nair males who were recognized by Chakami Swamigal as relentless and fierce fighters uh, and had to remain at the war front to defend the imaginary Kerala from its enemies. So the impact of Chakami Swamigal's uh, Prajina Malayalam is not limited to uh, uh, historically reimagining of Kerala as a land of Nairs, but it became a leading source of inspiration for the Savarna elites to reconfigure a politics and cultural strategy that was more or less founded on the professed supremacy of Nayas to mediate, arbitrate, and define a sense of national uh, ideology of the Kerala of nationalism. And this is precisely the contribution that uh, Chattami Swamigal made to the neo savarnada uh, uh, of later Kerala. So Chattami Swamigal uh, was always been understood. I mean, I'm coming to a conclusion. I'm, I'm just trying to recapitulate what I'm trying to, what I was trying to say here. Uh, uh, you know, Swamigal was always uh, understood, and rightly so, as a great proponent of Kerala uh, uh, renaissance by the progressive historians and a most revered Ajaya guru and enlightened Rishi for the conservative Savarna. Yamas in his and Astriyo had considered him as a formidable link between Eritachan and Vallathol, observing that, uh, you know, Chattami Swamigal was instrumental in breaking the monopoly of the Brahmins. That, according to Yamas, began with Eritachan's uh, composition of uh, Adhyatma Ramayana, the process of, uh, you know, breaking the knowledge monopoly <coughs> of the Brahmins. So he notes that it is with Vallathol's translation of Rigveda into Malayalam that the project that began with Eritachan and continued by Chattami Swamigal helped the dissemination of the monopolized knowledge among downtrodden become complete. So this is EMS's view. I mean, you know, he categorically stressed the importance of the theological reformers like Swamigal along with Sri Narayana Guru, Brahmananda Sri Yogi, Vagbadanandan and others. 
uh, who he says, quote, I'm, I'm quoting, beginning with spiritualism, reached modern nationalism and thereby paved the way for the dissemination of the spirit of uh, a Navodana movement, which in fact is, is, is a valid point. But then, uh, uh, you know, there is also to foreground a advanced and complex position of Neo-Chattami Swamigal in the history of political society and civil society in, 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 in Kerala. The three texts discussed, you know, here in my presentation today are connected by the anxiety over Chattami Swamigal's own enterprise of spiritualism and its legitimation. Uh, impacts and implications. While many of his views borrowed the reformist rhetoric that was popular in the religious discourses of his time, his major concern aligned with the way in which the Hindu faith could be re-represented in the public sphere. So his reputation of Christianity, reputation of religious traditions that prevent access to Vedas to the Sutra caste, and reputation of Brahmanical institution of Kerala caste system, you know, Nambudri system, involved a negative dialectics an exercise he thought was essential to establish the affirmative hermeneutics he developed in his later writings. So, unlike Srinayana Guru, whose caste, whose caste identity placed him completely outside the Chadravarna system, Swamigal was constantly reminded of his lowly status within the Varna framework and the consequent restrictions on him to pursue the philosophical spiritual project of Vedanta that was very close to his heart. So, his mediations with the self as a spiritualist entailed several layers of neg negations of the multiple others in the form of Christianity, Vedic exclusionism, Kerala Brahmanism. So, while his major objective was to accomplish these negative transcendences for his own spiritual evolution, its rather unintended beneficiary was the Nair Jingoist politics that drew inspiration from both, I mean, intended or intended, I'm not very sure, uh, both life and works to articulate a hegemonic new Savarnata, which believed in its cultural, ideological, and social supremacy over other castes and communities. So Robin Jeffrey stopped at 1900, you know, decline of Naya dominance in Kerala, his famous book, where he talked about the decline of Naya dominance. Uh, but post-1900, Kerala society witnessed a resurgence of Naya dominance in the political, social, and ideological realms, marked by the, uh, the regrettable success of a conservative agenda that the Naya service society relentlessly pursued both before and after independence. The Hindu that Swamigal carefully outlined with all its limitations and persons provided one major one of the major sources of ideological capital that served the conservative agenda of the Sudra Naya elites and their frontal organizations in multiple ways. The tensions, contradictions and inconsistencies of Swamigal's implausible history and philosophy could otherwise be seen as a checkered trajectory of a seeker of spiritual enlightenment belonging to the lower echelon of the caste hierarchy that operate within the constraining ideological framework of the uh, Varna system. I, can I pause here? Yes. Yes, I think we are, uh, I am very glad that we were able to, uh, you know, complete this lecture because we had lost you at a very, you know, crucial point, the point that you just made, which I think uh, really uh, shows how important this analysis is for our understanding of the rise of the neo savarna in Kerala. Who this social formation is really of interest to all of us uh, who are watching with trepidation, if I might use that word, the rise of Hindutva sentiments in the social domain. I am, uh, I mean, it would have been wonderful to have a question part to this lecture, but we have far exceeded our time. Uh, it's past five, it's ten, nearly 11, 12 minutes past 10. So unless someone has an extremely urgent question to ask Dr. Sri Kumar, we should be closing. So however, before I close, I just want to ask the audience if anyone has a really urgent question that you would like to ask him. We can extend this session till uh, 5.15 or 5.20, if necessary. Please switch on your mics and ask. Otherwise, they...
So while others are thinking, I would like to ask a question. It's not really so much a question, but a comment. Um, you know, I, your work as, I mean, I am able to ask this question because I think I have read your work before. For the others, it's a lot to take in. You know, it take, I think it's a lot to process before quick question, questions can emerge about this very rich analysis that you've presented. No, I have been very interested in your work precisely because of because I've been thinking about uh, Savarna women and um, feminism in Kerala, because I've always had this strong feeling that Savarna women um, do benefit very heavy, very strongly from their caste location. And mm -hmm. that is just, that's also not, not just because it's a structural advantage, but also because uh, within the uh, with the ideological horizon of of the Nair, um, even though Chattambi's call to include women as readers mm -hmm. and interpreters of the Vedas may not heed it, I think the new domestic domain that was formed in the 20th century did concede to women a considerable role in ritual performance within the domestic, the new domestic. Uh, so I'd like to know what your reflections are on that, because we know that Kachatambi's famous uh, special, uh, you know, speech on Prabhanjatil Sri Purushan Markula Stanam. For all his talk about including women as interpreters of the Veda, he does fall back on a, a colonial, actually one could very well say a Victorian neo-Brahmanical framework of the uh, vision of the world divided into private and public domestic yeah absolutely i mean uh, you, you're absolutely right i mean uh, I, I do not uh, actually uh, <clears throat> domestic and public spaces so yeah, sure. is that a further contradiction in chatambi's work you know you mentioned several contradictions would yeah, you uh, like uh, to include what... this as part of those contradictions as well uh, absolutely see that's precisely why i said when he was uh, trying to you know uh, uh, kind of interpret uh, uh, the the uh, the Vedic text, you know, like the right to interpret, right to read, right to listen for women also belonging to all all one night. It was an unlikely uh, coalition that uh, you know, uh, like he was talking about. I think you know his major uh, uh, the major reason why he wanted to resort to this um, you know examples of uh, women, uh, uh, you know, because he somehow sensed this subalternity of the sudra and you know, subalternity or the women, I mean, you know, in a patriarchal uh, uh, society. So, you know, that kind of an insightful, uh, uh, you know, approach uh, could uh, enable him to force this alliance, but that alliance was, uh, 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 you know, strictly for the purpose of, uh, uh, you know, legitimizing his own spiritual enterprise, you know, not for women, you know, uh, uh, to take a lead from this and proceed. Uh, and that I have actually mentioned in the paper. I mean, there are, there are evidences in text that, you know, uh, you you cannot actually take all the Vedic texts, you know, as true, and then you cannot actually, you know, uh, uh, you know kind of define a way uh, 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 all decent also as un, uh, unrelevant, irrelevant. So there is a there is a there is a certain sense of uh, 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 you know uh, <clears throat> the 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 master's uh, 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 choice of what to take and what not to take. Uh, uh, in his narrative, I mean, you know, like there is, there is somebody has a privilege, somebody has a special privilege to tell others. I mean, you know, even when it is refuted, what what part of the text can be refuted and what can be accepted? That he makes very clear. That's a, that's the most nuanced part of his critique of uh, of Vedas. I mean, you know, he does not he does not allow us to take a stern position on, uh, 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 you know, whether you can criticize Vedas or not, or or, or completely discard Vedas or not. On the other hand, he takes Vedas as our uh, our, 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 our of the Vedas, uh, you know, at the same time, he says that uh, once it is orally transmitted, there is a possibility that it gets polluted. And then what is polluted and what is not polluted? He is an arbitrary, whimsical, you know, idiosyncratic, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of exercise to discern uh, by a person who is privileged to do that. And that is actually that I mean, that, 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 that provides us a, a, a kind of lead into uh, the the advanced reading that he provides of, of the Vedas in in, in its relation to uh, uh, you know other claimants for uh, the right to Vedas. Uh, so he but but then at the same time you know uh, he had a feminist uh, uh, he 
uh, the theology of, of Hinduism in his mind when he you know talked about the equality of uh, men and women and then the right of women to uh, you know uh, kind of divorce and then marry and, and, and things like that and, and and the word he uses is winner boo i mean you are reborn again uh, uh, you know out of a wedlock i mean you come out you are another person i mean you are no longer the other person so you are not bound to that uh, man and you know, whom you have uh, you know kind of discarded so th that kind of very uh, uh, you know kind of radical uh, feminist perspective where you know, inbuilt in its uh, in it in his analytical framework, but at the same time, he did not think that it is is on us. It's responsibility to take them forward. He left them there and then proceeded with his purpose. I mean, which was actually, so so the so the 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 the, the connection between the uh, the three successive works, uh, you know, uh, that he wrote, uh, refutation of Christianity, and then Vedadigar and Nirubanam and Prajina Malayalam is uh, uh, out there for us to uh, you know kind of discover and interpret. Thank you very much for that. Now, does anybody else have a question? If not, we can close the session. I don't think so. I don't think anyone else has a question. Um, I'm sure they you you know you will receive many personal requests uh, for clarification. Um, I'm really grateful for this um, you know very detailed and rich presentation today. It does honor to the Akam lectures. Uh, thank you very much. And I I am closing the session. Once again, thank you very much, Titi, for this wonderful. I'm just happy to see, happy to see you know, Murdul, Chivan, and then Sunil, David Raman, and all other friends here once again. Thank you for coming. Great.